message today. I want you to take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 12. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I sort of thought I was going to be heading a little different direction for this morning and had a, a message that I was already working on and sort of I really already had it ready to preach. And then yesterday, just spending some time in Bible study, and uh, the Lord really began to work in my heart from Hebrews chapter 12. And so I want to talk to you today just for a little bit about this subject, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, we have been bringing a lot of messages, and here again, I, you know, I, I try my best. Uh, typically, I'll start praying on Sunday night after the service for what God would have me to bring the following week. I start praying for truth, and the Lord will start uh, showing me what he wants me to give to his people, and I start praying that prayer on Sunday night after the service, and just trying to follow the will of the Lord, but it seems like the Lord has, pre has preached on salvation so much here lately, um, and we're going to sort of follow on that path again today, and I know the Lord has a reason for this, and, and so we're just going to trust the Lord, and we know his word never returns void. And so we'll just trust the Lord on that. Hebrews chapter 12 in your Bibles, when you find your place, if you're able to stand, why don't, why don't we stand this morning out of respect for the reading of God's Word? And we're going to read uh, just the first few verses, and then we're going to pray, and uh, we'll dive into this Bible study. We are going to use our Bibles uh, considerably this morning, so keep your Bibles open and handy, if you will. We're going to turn to several places today, and all these verses are good verses that your eyes really need to fall upon, and so... Let's look at it today. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Notice what the writer of Hebrews says. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, I want you to especially notice verse 2. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And I want us to read verse 3 as well. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You may be seated this morning. But I want to draw your attention to verse 2. That's where we're going to camp out just for a little bit today. This is going to be super, super simple. I started not to even uh, put any points up on the screen. They'll put a point or two up there for you today just, for, uh, just so you can maybe hold on to these. But a very simple message. We'll just sort of hammer one nail today. And I want to talk to you about that subject that you see right there in the first part of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, notice these words, the author and finisher of our faith. Well, I'd read that many times. In fact, that's one of my memory verses here more recently, but I never really focused on the first part of that verse, the author and the finisher of our faith. What does that mean? Now, I'm going to try to explain that to you if I can this morning just for a little bit, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Father, thank you so much for this uh, time together. Uh, I don't know about anybody else, but Lord, it, for me at least, this has been a wonderful, beneficial morning. I've been helped, encouraged, I've been inspired and strengthened. And God, I believe that I'm going to go away from this service better because of this time. I believe that's what you had in mind when you instituted the church. This is not supposed to be just a social club. God, this ought to be a place of help. It ought to be a spiritual hospital God, it ought to be a place where we receive encouragement, where we receive the word, where the Spirit of God is able to work in our life, whether it might be through conviction or exhortation or whatever it is. And God, I pray today that you would bless our discussion. And, and uh, Lord, uh, there, there is one subject that we cannot afford to be wrong on, and that's salvation. We've got to be right on this. And so, Lord, I pray that you would teach us in a more perfect way concerning our salvation. I would say most here today already have the salvation that I'm going to preach on this morning. But it's still important for them to hear this. And then there may be some in a crowd this size that have never come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. And maybe even now, 
The Spirit of God is working in their heart, revealing to them their need of a Savior. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would teach us concerning this wonderful, wonderful thing of salvation. Lord, bind the powers of darkness. Oh, God, please do that. And I pray that the precious Spirit of God would have liberty, great liberty, to move freely. And I pray that you would accomplish your perfect will and your Son would be lifted up. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, we pray, and for his sake, and all the Lord's people said, amen. Somebody said, nothing, at least outside of God, nothing just came into existence. That's true. Nothing ever just came into existence. For instance, the automobile that you drove into the parking lot this morning did not simply materialize. That automobile, whatever, whatever you drive, whether it's a Chevrolet or a Toyota or a Nissan or whatever you drive, that automobile did not just materialize. That automobile had to have a manufacturer. It had to be manufactured. Nothing outside of God simply materialized. In the same respect, books don't write themselves. They must have an author. And I think that's what we see here in Hebrews chapter 12. The book on faith and salvation did not just come into existence. It wasn't something that man decided to put together. People sometimes say, I don't believe the Bible. A bunch of men just got together and put that book together. Well, uh, I hate to tell you this, but you are uh, seriously confused when you say that. This is a very serious, a very spiritual, supernatural book that's really a miracle of God. That book that you hold in your lap right now is a miracle of the Lord, and it has been kept pure and preserved, and, uh, and we're very thankful for that. But in the same respect here, I want you to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ wrote the book on being saved. He wrote the book on going to heaven, on having eternal life. And you know, this is interesting as well. It's something that I never really paid attention to in Hebrews chapter 12. The Lord Jesus Christ did not just merely write the book. He finished it. He finished it. Now, what does that mean? Well, some of you maybe have written a book or written a pamphlet or something like that. And many times a writer, when writing a book, will produce the rough draft. And then he'll take that rough draft and he will pass it off to a proofreader. And that proofreader will go through those pages and he'll make sure that punctuation is right. He'll make sure that the words are spelled right. He'll make sure that words are where they're supposed to be. And he will proofread the book. And then that proofread copy will be passed off to a publisher and that publisher will publish the book. And I want you to understand the Lord Jesus Christ did not do it like that. The Lord Jesus Christ wrote the book on salvation and then he proved it. Amen. He finished it. He, that, that word uh, where the Bible says he's the finisher of our faith, it means this, that he wrote the book, he authored the book, and then the Bible says he completed that same book. He did not depend on someone else to do it. He wrote the book himself. Amen. Now, that's important for us to understand. Several years ago, some of you are old enough to remember this time. Back in 1994, there was... Uh, uh, and this was, you know, early on, this was before they were televising all the, the court cases and, and, and things like to do today. I'm not even sure they had a court channel back then, and I'm not even sure they have a court channel now, but I, I would say they have something similar to that. And, but anyway, 1994, there was a celebrity that, that most of you folks that were back in that day, you, know, you knew that name. His name was O.J. Simpson. And O.J. Simpson was a a sports celebrity. He was a football player. He was very well-known, very athletic, good-looking guy. And uh, turned into a, you know, after his football career, turned into a movie star and had a sportcaster. And he was just very popular and and, uh, all over the television. It was nothing to go home on a Sunday afternoon with a football game going on. And O.J. Simpson would be there with the other guys and he would be sportcasting the game. And uh, just very well-known, very successful guy. And he and his wife, at least until they split up, he and his wife lived in a community called Brentwood, California. And anyway, there were problems in the marriage, and most of you know this, that O.J. Simpson was accused of not just murdering his wife, but he was accused of violently murdering his wife and her boyfriend. 
uh, I mean, just in a brutal, in, in a, a brutal fashion. Well, they took the thing to court. Some of you remember the, the uh, famous chase, you know, where uh, O.J. Simpson's driving through Los Angeles and, and all those uh, police cars are behind him. And uh, anyway, long story short, they took this thing to court and they pretty much had it sealed up. And, uh, and they, were, uh, they had found evidence of, uh, uh, of this brutal murder. Well, long story short, they had a forensic specialist on the stand. This is the way the story was reported. And and the defense attorney for O.J. Simpson was really grilling this forensic scientist, and he was really trying to make him look foolish. And so this attorney, and all this is being telecast on television, and so this attorney began to ask this forensic scientist, he began to ask him a series of questions, for instance, He said, sir, he said, could you tell the court uh, which forensic college you graduated from? And this scientist said, sir, I didn't graduate from a forensic college. He said, oh, you call yourself a forensic expert and you didn't graduate from a forensic college? He said, yes, that's correct. Well, he came back and he said, well, Tell me this, he said, which forensic teachers did you study under? Which professors taught you and, and, uh, and instructed you? And, and the scientist came back with this answer, sir, I never studied, studied under any forensic professors. And boy, this attorney, man, he was, I mean, he was really getting bold. He said, well, I guess you could tell us this then. He said, how did you score on your forensic exams? And this scientist answered back and said, sir, I never took any forensic exams. And that attorney went in for the death blow. He said, you mean to tell me that you never went to a forensic college? Yes, sir. You never studied under forensic professors? Yes, sir. You never took any forensic exams? And he said, yes, sir, that's exactly right. He said, then how in God's name are you gonna stand here on this stand and tell this court that you're an expert when it comes to forensics? And the man said, because I wrote the book. I didn't go to a forensic college. I didn't study under forensic experts. I wrote the book on forensic science. Now, I thought about that story when I read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. You understand the Lord Jesus Christ wrote the book on saving faith. He didn't study under someone. He didn't take classes from someone. He didn't go to the Salvation University, friend. He wrote the book. Now, you know what that means? And this is so important. It means that the Lord Jesus Christ determined the plan that decides our eternal destiny. He determines the plan. Now, there are some people who say, well, you know what, preacher? I just can't believe that God, if God's such a God of love, I just can't believe that God sends people to hell. False. That's false. That's a false statement. God doesn't send people to hell. People send people to hell. You see, God gave us a plan. God gave us an option. God gave us a choice. God has created a way for all men and women and boys and girls to be saved. But here's the thing, here's the thing. But you must be saved according to the book. You've got to be saved according to the book. Now, the problem is this. A lot of folks want to author their own book. A lot, of fo- a lot of folks, you know what? They want to go by their own book. And so now we have all kind of books. And uh, we have self-made books and man-made books. And some of these man-made books say, well, if you're going to go to heaven, if you're going to have eternal life, you've got to be baptized. That's what they tell us. You've got to be baptized. This is what it says. You've got to be baptized. And, uh, and so they, they say, listen, if you don't get baptized, you're not going to go to heaven. And yet we find in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 17 Paul said this, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. That's not saying that baptism is not important, but it is saying this, that faith in the gospel of Christ is priority. That's what the Bible is saying there. And yet there are some who say, no, 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 no. You've got to be baptized. 
If you're going to go to heaven, you've got to be baptized. And yet, in Luke chapter 23, we have a a, a criminal that's hanging on the cross. He realizes that Jesus really is the Son of God. And he says to Jesus, I'm talking a man about a man that has ruined his life. I'm talking about a man that has a horrible reputation. I'm talking about a man that never accomplished much in his life. And yet, at that very end of his life, he realized that Jesus really is the Savior. And he says to Christ, Lord, remember. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And the God of God said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Church, can I remind us that thief never had the opportunity to come down and get in the baptismal pool. He never had the opportunity to get baptized. And yet Jesus said, Today you're going to be with me in heaven. Now why is that? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus wrote the book. That's why. And so those people who just make things up and say, well, this is what I believe. This is my opinion. I'm not concerned about your opinion. And by the way, for that matter, neither should you be concerned about my opinion because your opinion doesn't matter and my opinion doesn't matter. What matters is Jesus wrote the book and you must be saved by the book. There are some who say, well, you know what? I believe this. I believe that you, if you're gonna go to heaven, you've gotta do good works. You, you must do good works. Evidently, that's what the Ephesians were reading. They were reading the same book like that. Because the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write to the Ephesians church in in, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Evidently, those that lived in Crete were reading out of one of those books. And so the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to encourage Titus and Titus was going down to be the bishop of Crete and he said in Titus 3 verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Evidently those in Rome were reading out of a book like that because the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write these words in Romans 11 verse 6, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Friend, this is what I'm saying. Jesus Christ wrote the book, and so Jesus Christ determines how you're saved, and Jesus Christ determines how I am saved. And so we don't need to be adding, uh, uh, you know, 10 other things And we don't need to be giving our opinion and saying, well, you know what, this is, and I've seen that. Some even here recently, uh, you know, I've seen people posting things like this on social media. Well, this, this is what I think. Well, listen, it's not really about what you think. It's all about what the author said in his book. Uh, And God, the Lord Jesus Christ is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. Now, you say, preacher, what does his book say about being saved? If Jesus is the author and he proved it, he completed it, then what does the book say about salvation? I want to give you two thoughts and we're going to be heading to the house. Two thoughts the Lord Jesus Christ gives us in his book when it comes to salvation. Number one, repentance is a necessity. Repentance is a necessity. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When you preach that anymore, it's controversial. And I don't really know why that's controversial. It shouldn't be controversial because it's in the Bible. Repentance is a necessity. Now, I want you to take your Bibles this morning, if you will, and turn to the book of Mark with me, Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And uh, and I understand Brother Terry taught on repentance last Sunday. And and so, hey, the Lord, evidently the Lord has got something going on here. And so let's talk about it a little bit more today. Mark chapter 1. And look, if you will, at verse number 14. Notice what the Bible says about this thing of repentance. You say, Pastor, what is it? I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to tell you exactly what it is and exactly what it's not. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse number 14. The Bible says, now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Look at verse 15, church, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Look what he says. Repent ye and believe The gospel. Now, I'm not going to have you turn there, but Luke 13, verse 3 says it like this. And this is Jesus speaking. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He said that twice, by the way, in that same chapter. Except ye repent, 
ye shall all likewise perish. The word repent there is the Greek word metanoo. Metanoo. And it means this. It means to think differently, to think differently or afterwards reconsider. To think differently or afterwards reconsider. It means a change of mind is what the word repentance there means. Now, I want to show you an example of that. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to the book of Acts this morning. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. It means to think differently or afterwards uh, to reconsider a change of mind. Uh, Something has changed your mind. Something has changed your direction. Something has changed your way of thinking. Uh, Look, if you will, at Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. All right, you found your place? Say amen. Amen. All right, wonderful. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Notice the first few words. The Bible says, now when, now when they heard this. That's very important. Don't forget what I said a moment ago. The word repentance means to think differently or afterwards reconsider. And the Bible says in Acts 2, verse 37, now when? What's going on, preacher? If you go back and read the first 37 verses, you know what's going on? They are preaching the gospel. I mean, they're preaching Jesus, that Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, that Jesus was resurrected. They're preaching the gospel. They're preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They're preaching the gospel. And then the Bible says in verse 37, now when? After they heard this, after they heard the preaching of the gospel, look what the Bible says. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38, then Peter said unto them, notice, what's the first thing? Repent, repent. Hey, folks, you better think differently. You better reconsider. You better understand something that the way you're going is not going to work. It's not going to get you there. If you keep going the direction you're going, you're going to die in your sin without a Savior, and you're going to end up in hell. Repent. That's what he's saying. You need to have a change of mind. Now, flip over one page and look at Acts chapter 3. And look at verse number 18, Acts chapter 3 and verse number 18. Notice what our Bible says, but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of of all of his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Look what he says in verse 19. Repent ye therefore. Why? Because of what you just heard. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, church, hear me out this morning, and maybe this, is, maybe this message is not as bombastic as some messages that I'll preach, but I'll guarantee you this, it's more important, it's, it's, it's as important and it, as any message that I'll ever bring from the pulpit of the Calvary Baptist Church. I want you to understand, we do not preach a hard believism at Calvary. It is not hard to believe. It is not hard to be saved. But I want you to hear the rest of this. But there is more to salvation than an empty prayer. We do not preach a hard salvation. Now, there are some who accuse us of preaching an easy believism. I don't believe we preach either one. I believe we preach a correct believism. It is not hard to be saved. It is not hard to be a believer. And so we don't preach that, but I do want you to understand something. It's more than somebody just coming to an altar and praying some mindless prayer. One, two, three, repeat after me. I'm not, listen, I'm not against the sinner's prayer. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not preaching that. Some of you, uh, listen, I'm not saying that, but I am saying this. Oh, listen, you better know what you're doing when you do it. Because it's so important. It's more than just coming down and signing a card. And it's more than just coming down and shaking somebody's hand. It's it's more than just coming down and kneeling at an altar. Listen, when you and I are born again, there must be repentance. Repentance. Now, you say, preacher, repentance, what do you mean? It is a change of mind. It is realizing I'm lost. You know, after hearing what I've heard, after hearing the gospel, after hearing what Jesus has done, I realize something. I reconsider something. Uh, Afterwards, after hearing this, I understand I'm going in the wrong direction. I'm not going in his direction. I've got to go in his direction. If I don't make my way to heaven, I must repent. You You know what repentance is? Repentance is understanding you are desperate. You are in desperate need of a Savior. 
Now you say, preacher, what are you talking about? You're desperate. I think a lot of Americans are missing that. You're desperate. Listen, I'm telling you something. I don't want some oxygen. I'm desperate for it. If you cut my oxygen supply off just for a little bit, everything's going to shut down. Preaching will stop. Speaking will stop. Life will stop. You see, I don't just need, I, I don't just want some oxygen. I'm desperate for oxygen. I'll tell you something else. I don't want, just want hydration. I got to have it. By the way, so do you. You can go without food for quite a little, a, a little while, but you've got to have water. You've got to have water to exist. Listen, it's not that you just want some water. You've got to have it. You've got to have some hydration in your body. Now, you say, preacher, why are you preaching? I'll tell you exactly why. Because there's a lot of people in America who feel like, you know what? I need a little bit of Jesus. No, you don't need a little bit of Jesus. You are desperate for Jesus. You are desperate for a Savior. Well, you know what? I'm just going to get a little religion. You're going to get a little religion. You're going to die in your sin and go to hell. That's exactly what's going to happen. Brother, it's not about religion. It's not about being a Baptist. It's not about being a Pentecostal or a Catholic or a Methodist or anything else. You've got to come to that place where you realize, man, I am a sinner on my way to hell. And if something doesn't change, I'm going to split hell wide open. You say, well, preacher, I don't think you ought to preach like that. Well, I'm just telling you, it's true. We are desperate. You say, pastor, not me, friend. Yes, you are. You say, but pastor, I'm not that bad. <laughs> Listen, the best of us is desperate. You say, pastor, I'm not a drug addict. Preacher, I'm not an alcoholic. Pastor, I'm not a, I'm not a womanizer. I'm not a prostitute. I, I, you know, I, I'm not involved in all those things. I work a job. I work 40, 50 hours a week. I, I support my family. I'm a good dad. I'm a good mom. I'm a good kid. I, I mean, I, I make straight A's. I, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm just telling you, it don't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your color is. It doesn't matter what your social standing is. It doesn't matter how big your bank account is. It doesn't matter how popular you are. I came here to tell you, you are desperate for Jesus. You're desperate. And those watching my live stream, I want to tell you something. You're desperate for a Savior. You've got to have him. You don't just need him. You've got to have him if you're ever going to make it to heaven. Now that, listen, he's, here's the thing. He wrote the book. And people say, I'm telling you one thing. I don't like that. It doesn't matter. Whether you like it or I like it, or at Hair Lips Hall of Union Grove. Or you say, preacher, I, I don't like that kind of preaching. It doesn't make me feel comfortable. And listen, I love you and I want you to be comfortable, but I'm just telling you something. I'm not here necessarily to make you comfortable. Amen. And it could be the Holy Ghost is the one that's trying to make you uncomfortable right now. And you may be here this morning and you say, preacher, everybody in the world thinks I'm saved. And I've told everybody, you know, I'm saved, but I know there's not a, there's not a lick of evidence in my life. I don't have not one ounce of assurance in my life. And, and uh, every night I go, to, I go to bed and I have to reconvince myself that I'm saved. And I'm not really sure if I'm going to heaven. And, and uh, all this, you know, I'm just telling you, today might be your day. But this is what the author said. Repentance. Repentance is a necessity. Not only that, but number two, we're done. Listen to this. Not only is repentance a necessity, but number two, righteousness is a necessity. Now, this is what the author said, that he is the author and finisher of our faith. He wrote the book. And he said this, that repentance is a necessity. Number two, righteousness is a necessity. Now, you say, Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm going to explain it to you. It cannot simply be any righteousness. It cannot simply be anyone's righteousness. Let me tell you something else, church. It can't be really good righteousness. Now let me show you what I'm talking about. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and look at verse number 20. Now please hear me out. We're almost done, but please hear me out. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 20. Let me tell you where most of the Bible belt is. We're right smack dab in the Bible belt, and some say we're in the buckle of the Bible belt. 
And you really can't even go out today and knock on doors and say, are you saved? Because everybody in the South is saved, whether they're saved or not. They'll tell you that they're saved. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and here's the reason. Most people, this is their mentality. If I am really, really, really good, I'm pretty sure I'll make it. I mean, if I'm really, really good, if I'm really, really, really good, I can't just be really good, but if I'm really, really, really good. And most people think, you know what, there's sort of a scale. And so it, what, what they've got to do, the bad is here and the good is here. And what I've got to do is I've got to put more good things over here on this part of the scale. And if I can make the scale, the good part of the scale, if I can make that go down, then I, God's going to let me into heaven. And, but if the bad part of the scale goes down and I don't do so good, I'm going to have to go to hell. My friend, uh, you, there's a major problem with that thought. It is not in the word of God because it is not really good righteousness that takes you to heaven. Now look what he said in Matthew chapter five and verse number 20. The Lord Jesus again is speaking. He said, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now that's saying something. You understand the Pharisees were righteous. In fact, they were so righteous, they were self-righteous. They were all about righteousness, you know. They uh, they dressed, dressed differently. They ate differently. They didn't eat things other people ate. They talked differently. They acted differently. They gave differently. They were incredibly uh, studious. You know, they, most of those Pharisees, by the age of 12, they had memorized the Pentateuch. They had memorized the first five books of the Word of God. I mean, completely to memory. And so these guys were, uh, you, you know, you talk about moral. You talk about, uh, uh, yes, they were proud and they were self-righteous. But you talk about moral and, uh, and righteous men. They were righteous. And yet Jesus came on the scene, and Jesus said, if that's what you're depending on, uh, that kind of righteousness, he said, you are never going to see the kingdom of God. And so it can't be really good righteousness. But I'll tell you something else. It can't even be your own righteousness. Now take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Philippians chapter number three. Philippians chapter number three. And look at verse number nine. Will you say, Pastor, I, I mean, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that if you're depending on your own righteousness to get you into heaven, it's not gonna get there. Now, I understand there are even preachers who would debate with me on this. There were priests who would debate with us on this. Uh, but I'm just telling you, they didn't write the book. He wrote the book. He's the author. He's the finisher. He determines uh, salvation. It can't be your own righteousness. Philippians chapter three and verse number nine. And be found in him, Paul said. And not, look at this, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Listen to this statement, church. We receive everlasting life in heaven when we are given the righteousness of God. Amen. Not your righteousness. Amen. You don't go to heaven because your grandpa was righteous. You don't go to heaven because your grandpa was a preacher. You don't go to heaven because your godly grandmother's buried in a cemetery. You don't go to heaven because you're the charter member of a Baptist church. Are you listening to me, church? We don't get to heaven because of good righteousness. We don't get to heaven because of our own righteousness. If you and I are gonna make it into heaven, it will be because we are given the righteousness of God. Matthew 6, uh, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Now let me show you what I'm talking about. Take your Bibles this morning. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And look what our Bible tells us. We must have the righteousness, not of ourselves. We must have the righteousness of God. You say, well, preacher, how do we get it? Hang on, I'm getting there. Hang on. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. I just want you to get the word here. Not just preaching. I want you to get the word Romans 3, verse 21, the Bible says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested 
being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Look at verse 22, church. Even the righteousness of who? Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. And so you and I are saved by having the righteousness of God. That's the only way you're going to make it into heaven. Not by your good works, not by your baptism, not by your church membership, not by you know being a good dad or good mom or whatever the case may be. We get into heaven by having the righteousness of God. Now, you say, okay, all right, preacher, I've heard you say that. How do you get it? Well, look at that same chapter. Romans chapter 3, look at verse 22 again. The Bible says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Listen, church, when we understand our desperate need of a Savior, that's repentance. I'm desperate. I've got to have him. If I'm going to make it to heaven, I've got to have him. And at that point, we place our faith and our trust and our belief in the finished work of Christ on Calvary, the death, the burial, the resurrection. You know what happens? God's righteousness, the Bible says, is imputed to our account. Now, what's that mean, Pastor? Hang in there with me. We're almost done. But man, oh man, don't you put your shoes on yet. Amen. I want you to flip over one page. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. I want to say that again. When we place our faith in Christ, when we become a believer, God's righteousness is imputed to our account. Romans chapter 4, verse 21. Look here, Calvary. The Bible says in verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Look at verse 22. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. By the way, church, this is talking about Abraham. Abraham believed, the Bible says, he believed God. And God imputed it to him for righteousness. And look at verse 23. You say, Pastor, is it only for Abraham? Well, aren't you glad there's a verse 23 and 24? The Bible says, now it was not written for his sake alone <laughs> that it was imputed to him. Oh, thank God for verse 24. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed if, we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. Uh, imputed, imputed. It's the Greek word, lojosomai, lojosomai. And it means this. It means to pass to one's account. To pass something to one's account. Martin Luther called it the wonderful exchange. The wonderful exchange. Now, it's been a little while since I've been in school. But we got a lot of kids in this room this morning. They're in school. But even you older kids, remember the days of report cards? Remember that? Remember when you tried to figure out how can I get this thing signed without my mom and dad signing it? <laughs> and uh, you remember that? You remember bringing home some scores that were not necessarily, <laughs> they were not necessarily stellar? And, uh, and you thought, oh man, I got a grounding coming. I know dad's gonna take my keys away. Uh, Dad's going to make me stay at home. Dad's going to make me study. And, uh, and, and you had bad marks on that report card. Now listen to this. Concerning our spiritual condition, our report card would have all Fs. You say, no, preacher, not me. Yes, you. Yes, I'm a straight-A student, maybe in school, but not spiritually. Concerning your spiritual record, report card, all of our marks would be Fs, Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And so our spiritually speaking, all the marks on our report card are Fs. You say, Pastor, that's bad news. It is. But here's what I'm preaching. When you repented or when you do repent and you receive Jesus as your Savior, you know what happens? Jesus takes your F's off your report card and he imputes his A's onto your report card. 
And so your report card's full of F's. Fail, 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 fail. And all of a sudden you realize one day I'm lost and I'm desperate for a Savior. And Lord, I cannot save myself. Oh God, I gotta have you, gotta have you, gotta have you, gotta have you. I gotta have you. And all of a sudden, man, the Spirit of God comes in and imputation takes place. Come on now. Imputation takes place and all your F's disappear and all of a sudden A's appear on your report card. And by the way, it's not because of you. It's all because because of him. Imputed, imputed righteousness. Second Corinthians 5, 21 says it like this, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Boy, that shouting ground, isn't it? Now we're almost done, but I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Let me show you what happens when you become born again. When you become a a saved child of God. Oh, this is good. And God allowed his prophet Isaiah to look down through the quarters of time. And God, Isaiah, perfect, perfect understanding of this thing of salvation. Isaiah 61.10 He said, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has, look at this church. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me (laughs) with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. What's that talking about? That's imputed righteousness right there. (laughs) We're poor. We're just clothed in a bunch of rags. I mean, we're naked, we're in shame, we're, in, we're living in embarrassment. We cannot save ourselves, we cannot clothe ourselves. And all of a sudden, out of the grace of God, when we come to the Lord and we accept our, our Lord uh, Jesus as Savior, you know what happens? All of a sudden, God clothes us with his own robe of, of righteousness. Amen. Imputation, imputed, imputed I read a story this week about a young man who took a once in a lifetime, he was a junior, a junior in high school, and he took a once in a lifetime trip to Europe. And his mom and dad had sort of left it, left it up to him for him to figure up all the logistics. And so he had figured up the expenses and all those kind of things, the room and the, all those things that he would have to do. Well, he got just a few days into the trip and he realized something. He realized that he had woefully misfigured and he was broke. I mean, he's thousands of miles away from home, and the boy's broke. He don't have enough money to go to McDonald's. And he thought, man, I'm, I'm in a mess. I, I don't have any more money. I've spent it all. He said, here, I'm a long way. I'm across the ocean from home. What in the world am I going to do? So you know what he did? He got on the telephone, and he called his mom and dad, and he explained the situation. He said, mom and dad, I'm broke. Mom and dad, I'm misjudged. I miscalculated. Mom and dad, I'm not going to make it. Mom and dad, I'm not going to make it. I don't even have enough for another meal. I don't know what I'm going to do. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute now. You know what that loving mom and dad did? They took money from their own. Oh, come on now. They took money from their own account. And they transferred money from their own account into their son's account. To make sure that it covered, come on, that it make sure it covered all the debt. <laughs> 42 years ago when I walked into a little country, uh, a little uh, a backwoods uh, uh, country office and talked to my pastor and he explained to me the gospel. And, and that day I, I, he said, Stephen, is that something you need to do? I said, yes, yes it is. And that day I called on Jesus Christ as my personal savior. And I said, Lord, I don't want to go to hell, but I want to go to heaven with you. And that day, hallelujah, glory to God, my heavenly father transferred his righteousness from his account into my account and put my sin on his son. And because of that, I'm on my way to heaven. And that's something to shout about today. Imputed, imputed. When we accept Christ as Savior, Christ transfers his righteousness into our account. Someone said it like this, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. 
For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. I don't, know if, I don't even know if this is a thing anymore. You older, more mature, wiser, intellectual folks in this room right here. You smart people that have common sense. Remember the day when we didn't have, you know, 2,000 sunglasses to choose from. Remember the old green sunglasses? You remember that? All the sunglasses back in the day were pretty much green. And, uh, and you'd put on these ugly green sunglasses. And here's the thing, they worked. They reduced the glare from the sun. The only problem with those sunglasses was this, everything you saw was green. The car was green, the grass was green, the dog was green. <laughs> I mean, everything was green. When you looked through those lenses, everything was green. Did you know that when you trust Christ as Savior and he imputes to you the righteousness of God, listen to this, from that moment on, God looks at you through the lens of Christ. Whew. And every time he sees you, he doesn't see you. He sees him. He sees Christ. You say, preacher, you think you're going to make it? I know I'm going to make it. How are you going to make it, preacher? Because every time he looks at me, he looks at me through the lens of Jesus. <laughs> and he sees the righteousness of his precious son. And you say, preacher, okay. You've been preaching on salvation so much. I'm already saved. Okay. I mean, I should have just stayed home if I knew he was going to preach on this today. Let me tell you something, church. Let me tell you, you saved people something. Did you know your dedication, your dedication to Christ is directly linked to how well you know about this thing of salvation? If you don't really think you're saved from a lot, you won't serve a lot. But if you ever get to the place where you realize, I was a sinner on my way to hell and he didn't have to, but he reached way down and picked me up and set my feet on a solid rock and established my goings and saved my soul and gave me the very righteousness of his son. You know what will happen? You'll say, man, i got to get busy because he's worthy. He's worthy of my service. He's worthy of my singing. He's worthy of my preaching. He's worthy of my testimony. He's worthy of me being dedicated. If you're here this morning, and you'll say, Pastor, I'm not sure I have that robe of righteousness. You can get it today. You can get it right now, right now before you leave. And you need to get it. We may not make it back tonight. Listen, Jesus may come before this service is done. And if you're not saved, why don't you let him impute the righteousness of God in your account today? Let's bow our heads. Father, we love you. Wow. Wow. Oh, God, thank you for a so great salvation. Oh, man, this is not some little thing that was done in a corner. God, this is big. This is big. Lord, I don't have to come back tonight. I get to come back. I don't have to read my Bible. I get to read my Bible. Lord, I don't have to pass out a gospel track. I get to pass out a gospel track. And I'm thankful that I can. And I'm glad to do it. Because, Lord, you saved an old unworthy sinner like me. One that could not work his way there. You saved one whose righteousness would never get him there. And, God, I'm thankful for that day where you imputed your righteousness to my account. God, it could be there's somebody here this morning that needs that imputed righteousness. And so right now, Holy Ghost, I pray that you'll work and I pray that you'll save and I pray that you'll transform lives. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're gonna sing in just a moment. But I wanna ask a question or two or three. 
First of all, how many are here this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking? And you say, brother, brother Pope, preacher, if I died today, there's not even a shadow of any doubt. I know that I know that I know that he has imputed to me his righteousness. And on my, on my way to heaven, if that's you with heads bowed and eyes closed, you just slip your hand up as a testimony. Oh, listen. And raise it to him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can lower your hands. But let me ask you this. How many are here this morning? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come back and try to drag you down this aisle. I would not do that, but I want to ask you something. How many are here this morning? You'd be, you'd be honest. And you'd say, Pastor, if I died right now, I am just not sure. I'm just not sure. I want to be sure. I'd hope to be sure. But I'm just not sure that heaven's my destination. I'm just not sure. And I care enough to slip up my hand and let you pray for me. If that's you this morning, you just slip your hand up right now, right now. Let me pray for you. I see that hand. Who else? Thank you for raising it quickly. Who else? Pastor, if I died, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. Would you pray? Would you pray for me? Anybody else like that? Just slip your hand up. Let me pray for you. Anybody else? I want to pray for you. So, Lord, I pray for these that have raised their hand. God, I sure pray that you'd show them how good you are. And God, I pray that you would give them understanding. And I pray that soon and very soon they'd come to know Christ as their personal Savior. Work in their heart, Lord, please. And we thank you. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I want to ask another question. Hey, child of God, how thankful are you for your salvation? It's a preacher to be quite honest with you. I hadn't really thought about it in a while. I hadn't really thought about it. But today, the Lord's got me thinking. Are you thankful enough to get busy serving the Lord, to get faithful, to be committed, to dedicate your life to Christ, to straighten your life up, to start talking like a Christian. If that's you this morning and the Lord has dealt with your heart, I'm going to ask you to do something in just a moment. I'm going to ask you to just tiptoe down to this altar and do business with the King of Kings and seal that decision at this altar this morning. So let's all stand right now if you would. Father, thank you for speaking to my heart today. And I know I'm up here jumping around and walking around and I know it's so much easier for me, but Lord, I, I thank you, though. I want to thank you for that imputed righteousness. Undeserving, undeserving, undeserving am I. But thank you for saving my unworthy soul. Oh, God, I pray in 2024 that, that you'll help me to, to serve you better, to be more dedicated to my Bible, to prayer, to church, to ministry, to soul winning. God, help me to be more dedicated. Couple it with your great mercy, please. God, have your way in this invitation, I pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're going to pause just for a moment. If you're here this morning and you need to tiptoe down, just come on right now. Just come. Just come. Somebody needs to come today. Just rededicate your life to Jesus. You say, Pastor, I am saved, but you know, I'm just not where I need to be. I know I'm not. The Lord's revealing it to me. I know I'm not where I need to be. Why don't you come today? Why don't you come today? Rededicate your life to Christ. Maybe somebody today just wants to come and just kneel on this altar and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, what a salvation. Thank you for saving my soul. Maybe there's somebody that you know that you love very dearly and they need this salvation that we preached about today. Would you come today maybe and just mention their name to the Lord? Hey, young people, you're sitting in class with kids that need Jesus. Hey, factory worker, you're working in factories with people that need Jesus. Office personnel, you're working in an office where people need the Lord. They need that imputed righteousness. 
you come, will you come? Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you for so great salvation. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do your perfect work right now. God, work in the hearts of these in the altars, work in the hearts of these in the seats. And Lord, I pray if nothing else, I pray that we'll go away from this place grateful with an attitude of gratitude because we've been born again. It was free for us, but it was costly for him. Lord, I pray that you'd uh, take us to a new level of dedication. God, do it. Do it. I, I, I pray you'd work now. Work in hearts. Work in my heart. God, help us to be faithful. Have thy way, Lord, please. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. We have some folks in the altar that have a Bible in their hand. And if you need prayer, we have some folks who would love to pray with you. Some are being prayed with right now. But if you need prayer, there's somebody here to pray with you. You may be here this morning. You say, Pastor, I'm saved. I've been saved for 20 years. But preacher, I've got the heaviest burden on my heart right now. And uh, nobody knows about it. I haven't told anybody. But I came in this place today so heavy hearted. I couldn't even hardly make it. Why don't you come and let somebody pray with you today. And and just go to the throne with you. And pray and, and believe God. Sometimes that helps. Will you come while we wait? If you're watching by way of live stream, we're delighted to have you today. Thank you for tuning in to the broadcast. There's a number on the bottom of your screen right now, 704-327-5662. And if we can pray with you about anything at all, and especially your salvation, please call that number right now. Would you call? And we have some folks that are waiting right by the phone, and they would love to, they'd love to pray with you right now. I hope you'll call. You can look up this way, church. I know you've been standing for a little bit. We're going to sing this little chorus that says, Just as I am without one plea. It's a good, good invitation song. If you're here this morning and you still have business that needs to be tended to, just come on. The invitation's wide open. Somebody will meet you here if you need them. And you come today while we sing today. Just as I am with one plea but that my blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to the old land of God I come I can we sing it again, church? Sing it again. Just as I am without one plea. Anybody else need to make a move? Now's a good time. And that thou bids me come to Play just a minute, Abel. Let's bow our heads just for a moment, if you would. Miss Tamara, would you come down and get his name for me, please? We're going we're to bring this thing to a close. It's 1243. We went over just a little. Anybody else? Anybody else need to make a move? You know what would really be terrible? Is to die and miss heaven after sitting in a service like this. And so don't do that. Whatever you do, don't do that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for a so great salvation. You can look up here. Let's sing it one last time and we're going to let you go to the house this morning. Sing it there with me. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou
can remain standing this morning. We're going to be dismissed in a word of prayer. And uh, just thankful. We're so thankful to be back. And uh, man, what a blessing. Thank you, church, for letting my wife and I get away just for a few days. And uh, we didn't do hardly anything. That's what we went to do. Amen? And, uh, but we had, a good, we had a good time, just a good time away. And we thank the Lord for that. And, and here's the great thing, too. It's wonderful when you don't dread coming home. You know? We were looking forward to coming home. And not just coming home, we were looking forward to get back into church and get back into, get back into ministry. And uh, we sort of hit the ground running on Friday when we got back in the Bronco. And uh, this is pretty much the truth. I had a list of names. And so I, I was on the phone from Daytona Beach, Florida, all the way to Savannah, Georgia, just uh, calling folks, talking to folks. And some of those folks had some needs and things like that. But anyway, while we were on the road, we got a call uh, from Miss Courtney. Miss Courtney called. And, and she said, Preacher, we want to tell you all something. And uh, Tatum got saved this week amen. and he wanted to he wanted to come up and tell that today amen and so amen so Tatum congratulations buddy that's big that's big God's got big gigantic plans for you he wants to use you you might change the world in fact you're going to change the world I believe that that's wonderful good good for y'all Taylor Courtney that's good Hey, parents, keep them in church. Amen. Keep them in church. Keep them under the gospel. That's so important, so important. Hey, listen, we love you. Hope you have a great afternoon. Don't, don't miss tonight. We'll have a special, I'll be here tonight. We'll have a special speaker, Brother Justin Bush. He's going to be preaching for us tonight. Some of our young men have been helping in the services today. Taylor and Raphael have spoken in the teen class today. Brother Timmy spoke in our, um, in our adult class. And then Brother Russell and uh, Brother Josh. Uh, Bradshaw, Brother Josh spoke in the uh, young adult class today. Uh, Brother Ethan's got a fever, and uh, he spoke in the young adult class. And so just wonderful to see some of these younger fellows helping, helping today. And then tonight, Brother Justin Bush is going to be preaching for us, and so I hope that you'll be in the service. Preacher, come on, if you will. We'll have, have you dismiss us in a word of prayer. Father, thank you this morning for allowing us to be here. And Father, what a blessing it is to know that we are saved not because of our righteousness, but because of the righteousness of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Have your will and way throughout this afternoon. God, help us keep our mind and our eyes set on thee, and may your will be done in my life and God in everyone's life in this room. May your will be done, and God, we look for your coming the coming of your son, and thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus for saving us in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Thank you for joining us today. We consider it an honor to serve you. And our prayer is that the service was a blessing and an encouragement to your life. If you were impacted today by the preaching of God's word, we encourage you to respond. If we can pray with you, or if you would like to make a decision today for Christ, please call us here at 704-327-5662. We have people waiting right now on the lines prepared to help you. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we hope to welcome you again soon. Have a wonderful week.